Good morning, Simple Church. It is so good to be with you, even if it's by video today, and to wish you and your families just a marvelous 2020. It is such a joy to start into a new year because we have great hope and some goals and some plans for wonderful things. And my prayer is that everything God wants for you and for me and for us together this year will be realized. We are down in Florida with our family on a vacation that was planned long before we even knew what we were going to be doing on this Sunday. And so I hope you're just a little bit jealous, but also I want you to know uh, we're in church this morning, you're in church, and let's uh, worship together and study together and just have a wonderful morning together. We're going to start today a brand new series that launches us into our two years of truth. And it's a study where we're going to take the Bible from Matthew to the Revelation, and then we're going to go to Genesis through Malachi. And we're going to study the whole Bible and see how it applies very strongly to our lives and to Christ being a part of our lives every single week that we meet. So I hope you'll be very faithful to this study and that we will learn a lot together. Most of us know a lot of the stories of the Bible, you know, stories like Adam and Eve and David and Bathsheba and Daniel and the lion's den and Samson and Delilah, and the list goes on and on and on. We know the stories in the Bible, but most of us don't really know the story of the Bible. And here's a key statement. If we don't know the story of the Bible, then it's easy to discount the stories in the Bible. You see, as a child, most of us, I know I certainly did, we received these nice little Bibles, you know, that have all the, the chapters and the verses all written out on paper, and, and then they're bound in this imitation leather cover with our names stamped in gold on there. And, and we love that, and we're taught things like, this is God's Word. It'll keep you from sinning. This will help you live your life right. And for many of us, we were taught that the Bible says it, if it says it, then that settles it. And I want you to know I believe that because I believe that the Bible is God's word to us. But something happens when we get into college and into adulthood that didn't happen when we were children. As children, we just take this by simple faith. Yes, 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 yes. But then we get into college and, and they start disputing a lot of the things in the Bible. And we get into adulthood and we start having a lot of questions about things in the Bible. And so today, many are walking away from the Bible or they're considering walking away from the Bible. And that's why this series and our next two years together of going through what we call the Word of God is so very important. So let's get started, okay? By the way, it's really fun having a Starbucks because I've always wanted to do this in church and I never get to do it, so pardon me. Don't you wish you could do that? I guess you got our coffee here, you're okay. The story doesn't begin in the beginning. It actually begins with a first century doctor by the name of Luke. And the book of Luke was really written to a friend of Luke's by the name of Theophilus. He was a believer but he wanted to have an orderly account of the events of Jesus' life. So here's what we read in Luke, starting with chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Many people, now among those people were Matthew and Mark and John and others who were documenting the times of the life of Jesus. He says, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. He says, all these things have been happening in Jesus' life and then even after his death. And a lot of people, he said, are writing this down and they're putting it into document form. He said, they use the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. You have to remember, when Jesus died, he was buried, and then he rose again. And for 40 days, he was with about 500 people who saw him, who ate with him, who talked with him, who heard him teach them. And then they saw him go back up into heaven to be with his father. So he says, Theophilus, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus. In other words, he was a pretty well-respected man in that day. He said, here's the reason I wrote it to you 
so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. Now, what do you have to realize? It's so hard for us because we got our little leather-bound Bibles, you know, as kids, and we had it all put together. But we have to realize when Luke was writing this document, he wasn't writing the Bible. Luke had no idea his writing, along with the writings of many others, would eventually be put into a book called the B-I-B-L-E. He was simply writing an orderly account of Jesus' life based on eyewitness reports and his investigative research. And he did it all for his friend, Theophilus. Now, another part of the story is this. When Jesus died and was buried, we have to understand, it was game over. It was done. At that time, there were no Jesus followers. There were no Christians. There were just a bunch of broken-hearted, disillusioned disciples who were scared, and they were running for their lives. Because this whole hope of a Jesus movement, this whole hope of a Messiah was dashed that day that they saw him die on the cross and then be buried in a grave. It was over. Because of Rome and their part in the crucifixion and the temple leaders and their part in stirring up the crowd to say, crucify him, crucify him, the Jesus movement had been crushed. It was over. And what we have to realize is this. If the story had ended there, if the story had ended with Jesus dying and then being buried, there would be no story. None. If the story had ended there, there'd be no Bible. There'd be no Christians. There'd be no church. And as we'll even see in this study, there would be no Old Testament. Because you see, if Jesus died and was buried, and that was the end of the story, then nothing else matters. He's just another dead good guy. So what we have to realize is the resurrection made all the difference. And what Luke was doing was documenting the life of Jesus because his life didn't end on that Roman cross. The reason anyone became a Jesus follower, because they had witnessed Jesus was alive. And that changed everything. That gave a whole brand new confidence and a source of joy and a source of purpose and a source of security to them as they faced down anyone who might even try to kill them because of their message. And so Peter, this guy who had denied Jesus three times and was scared to death, after he saw the risen Savior, he was speaking to Caiaphas in Acts 2, 32, and he said, God raised Jesus from the dead, and we were all witnesses of that. In other words, we didn't read about it. We didn't hear about it. We saw it. So now we go back to Luke chapter 1, and here's what he's saying. Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. Now, I've got to have you understand right here. We have to understand together that there was no such thing as the B-I-B-L-E in Luke's day or John's day or Matthew's day or Mark's day or Paul's day or Peter's day. There wasn't a Bible. Okay? So, so we have to ask the question, why were there so many documents being written? Why were all these people writing down these things? It says, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. And the reason is because something extraordinary had happened, and it had to be preserved. And all these people were, were demanding that it be, reserve, be, be preserved. What was it they wanted to preserve? Well, John pops in. <laughs> and it's so cool, because each of these people, they didn't know they were writing 
of you being used of God to write the Bible. So what happens is they were all just writing down what they'd seen and what they'd heard from credible witnesses, what they knew to be true. And so John is writing a document also. And he says over in John chapter 20, verse 31, but these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. So Luke's writing his document, and John's writing his document, and Matthew's writing his document, you know, and Mark's writing his document. But John, because he's writing his document, says really in that scripture, he's saying, if all you have is my account, my account is all you need, because I'm telling you what happened. The Messiah came. I saw him. He's alive. He's real. His message is true. And then John is the one who interrupted Nicodemus because Nicodemus came and was asking all these questions about how are you born again and do you have to go back into your mom's womb and all that stuff. And uh, John writes the good news, the gospel. And, And really, you have the whole Bible right here in one verse. You know it by heart. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone, that means the whole world, everyone who believes in him will not perish. That means be lost to God, but will have eternal life. God's life right now and life with God forever. So what John was really saying is, because he didn't know there was going to be a whole bunch of other books written. He didn't know there was going to be a lot of other documents collected together. He was basically saying, if all you have is my account, my account is all you need. And he was writing that 270 years before the Bible was collected into a book of 66 documents, 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. Interesting. So interesting. Now, from this Jesus movement, the church was born. And what's interesting is the church was born, but there was no B-I-B-L-E yet. All that was there were multiple thousands of Christians and hundreds of documents floating around about Jesus' life and works. And copies were meticulously made of these documents, and a few people had them, but they weren't really available to the public because they hadn't been put together in any way that would be publicly available. And so they were just teaching about it in the local church, and a few people had these documents that had been copied meticulously. And Luke continues to document the history of the church. So he wrote his book called The Gospel of Luke, all about Jesus' life and death and resurrection and all that that means for us. But he continued documenting the life of the church for about 30 years in a book that we call The Acts of the Apostles, where we see the faith becoming more and more given to the Gentiles, not just to the Jews. And that movement the church, would shape all of Western civilization. Unbelievable what happened back there right after Jesus died and was buried and rose again and went back to be with his father. And then the church just came alive. The Holy Spirit came and the power was there and the confidence was there because we saw him. He's not dead. He's alive. And the church went wild. The Bible says that those disciples who had seen Jesus Christ alive and who had heard the credible witnesses of Jesus being alive, those disciples, (laughs) they changed the world. Acts puts it this way, they turned the world upside down. People believed so strongly that they were willing to die for their faith. And what's interesting was, 
I mean, to thee, I mean, this is one of the great proofs of the, of the resurrection and the power of the Spirit of God in those early Christians' lives, the power of the working of God in the church, because you see, Rome was totally against Christianity. Rome was very, very superstitious. And when something went well, they thought their gods, little g, their gods were happy. And when it went wrong, they looked for someone to blame. And as they were starting to decline as a nation, they increasingly were blaming the Christians. A, a late first century writer by the name of Tertullianus, he wrote this. He said, if the Tiber floods the city, or if the Nile refuses to rise, or if the sky withholds its rain, or if there is an earthquake, a famine, or pestilence, at once the cry is raised, Christians to the lions. <laughs> in other words, the Christians were getting blamed for everything that was going wrong in the Roman Empire. And so, because of that, it culminated in 303 AD when Emperor Diocletian made an edict that resulted in the worst Christian persecution there ever has been in the world. And here were some of the things that he said had to happen. Every Christian house of worship must be destroyed. The assembly of Christians is illegal. You cannot get together any longer as Christians. All spiritual leaders must recant their faith, offer a sacrifice to the Roman gods, and declare that Caesar was their Lord or they would be killed. And worst of all, all Christian literature, now understand, that was all these documents, hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of documents that were being written to validate the truth of what happened in Christ's birth and life and death and resurrection and ascension and then the spread of the church to the then known world, all Christian literature was to be turned in and burned. And if you were caught with any, you would be killed after you watched your wife and your children be executed. That was Diocletian. Nice guy, huh? And he put that kind of edict over all the Christians. Multitudes of people died protecting. Now, now get it. They were not protecting the B-I-B-L-E because it didn't even exist. Okay. They were protecting copies of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and copies of Paul's writings and Peter's writings. And even during that persecution, Christianity continued to spread. It's so interesting about persecution. It seems like it almost fires up Christians. You know, we've gotten so lazy in this day and age because we're so blessed with security and we can go out in the streets and preach the gospel in most places if we want to in America. But you'd even speak the name of Jesus. You even hold a piece of Christian document in your hand back in those days. You could be imprisoned. You could be killed, and uh, a lot were. Well, political reform came, and it eased some of this persecution. Now, what's so amazing to me is that in like in the 30s AD, Jesus was crucified, and the church started, and within 200 years, I guess it's 300 years. Within 300 years, what had happened was that Christianity had overtaken the Roman Empire. This mighty nation was overtaken by Christianity. Here's how it happened. By the year 324 AD, Constantine the Great canceled the edicts of Diocletian. And he returned property to the church, and he allowed Christians to worship freely. And in not too long a time, Christianity became the preferred religion and faith of Rome. And as you know, out of that even today has come the Roman Catholic Church. And it's still going strong today in many, many parts of the world. It's amazing the change 
that happened. And out of that have come all of the Protestant churches and all of the Bible preaching churches to where there are untold numbers of them all over the world today, all because some people back right after Jesus' death and burial and resurrection, they started writing documents. <laughs> Just to say, this is what I saw. This is what I know these people to be true saw. And we experienced it, and we heard Jesus say it, and, and we got to write it down. we got to preserve it so that these messages aren't lost. They're available for the future. And you and I, we pick up our Bibles, our B-I-B-L-E's, and we say, isn't this nice? Oh, like all these little chapters and verses, and they're all divided and printed, and isn't that nice? They didn't have any of that for 300-plus years. They didn't have any of that. They just had those documents floating around. Well, when this change happened in the Roman Empire, it's so cool. For the first time, Christian scholars could meet publicly, not under the threat of persecution. And they could bring together this extraordinary collection of valuable and reliable, what we would call New Testament documents. And they sat down, the elders of the church, the bishops of the church by that time, the leaders, the, the people who knew the most about God and his work in people's lives. And they sat down with those documents. And now the stage was set for the very first, what is called Ta Biblia, or we would say the B-I-B-L-E, the Bible. There's so much to this story, and uh, I hope you won't miss the next three weeks because we're going to take you right through until hopefully by the time we're finished with these four weeks before we get into our two years of truth, actually, that you and I will say, oh my God, what a miracle of your grace and your kindness to give us your truth because one of the key verses in the Bible is this, you will know the truth and it will set you free. And if there's anything God wants for his people, it's freedom. But that freedom only comes from knowing and loving and obeying God's word to us as recorded in the documents, as assembled into a book called the Bible. So I hope you won't miss any of these next three weeks because they lay the whole foundation. If we're going to study starting in Matthew in February, then we got to understand what are we studying? Why is it important? How does it apply to our lives? What does God want the Bible to mean to you and to me? I also want to encourage you to sign up for our two years of truth Bible reading. Because if we will take the next two years and in small little increments every day sent to us over our phone devices, I'm telling you, it's an amazing thing of what God can do to help the Word of God, the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, to become alive and life-changing in our lives. So here's Brandon to tell you a little bit more about how you can read the Bible through in the next two years. God bless you. Happy New Year. It's so good to have shared with you this morning.